Co-op City. How's everybody doing? Good morning. Uh, my name is Trish Davis. I'm one of the pastors here. And whether you are joining us online, hello. If you're in Indiana, it snowed. We got excited. And then it was like half an inch. Um, if you're here in the room, regardless where you're tuning in, I'm so grateful that you are here today. We are in week three of our different series, and this um, series was inspired by a book by John Mark Comer called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. It's a pretty easy read. It's very practical and very honest. If you haven't bought it, I highly, highly suggest it, that you get it. But this whole idea from this book that we've been asking is, how do we live life different? Right? How do we live an unhurried life? How do we ruthlessly eliminate hurry? And we've been asking these questions like, how do we eliminate hurry and still be productive? How do we eliminate hurry and still show up for our people? How do we eliminate hurry and, and feel like we can live this full life that Justin talked about rather than a hurried one. And today, I wanna ask what I believe is the fundamental question to, be an to answer all of these questions, right? And the question is this, how do we simplify our lives in a complicated world? How do you simplify your life in a complicated world? Now, if you have your phones out, I want you to, or like if you're a paper person like I am, I do both, I'm with technology, but I want you to open up your notes app or I want you to write this down. I'm gonna ask two very simple questions. And these questions are simple, but I'm telling you to be able to answer them is gonna be pretty difficult. So I don't expect you to answer them now, but if you wanna jot some things down, that's cool. But the first question is this, who or what is getting your best? Who or what is getting your best? And it's Sunday, you've lived a full week. When you think through your week, like, who got the best of you? Okay, question number one. Question number two, who or what is getting your leftovers? Ouch, I know. And here's the deal with these two questions. You can be crushing it with what you're giving your best to or who you're giving your best to, but it not, may not be what you should be giving your best to or who you should be giving your best to. Right? We, we lived at this hurried paced life and we've been talking about how do we uncomplicate the, these chaotic moments we find ourselves in our, in our lives. I mean, th these are two very simple questions that evoke lots of emotions, right? Lots of feelings. And what happens is when your day is filled with running from here to here to there and you're like, oh, I, I, I did my best here, but gosh, I really wanted to do my best here. We live in this place of chaos. Anybody with me? Right? We feel chaotic. Well, I love words. I can't spell them, but I love them so much. And I love learning like where they came from and really the deep meaning. And so I looked up the word chaos and some synonyms for chaos. And I don't know why they made me giggle, but they did. Um, disarray, discord, anarchy. I had no idea. I made it on there. Disorder, pandemonium, turmoil, clutter, and disorganization. That hurt my heart right? Okay, I'm not making this up. This was in the thesaurus. A synonym for chaos is holy mess. I think that's hilarious. Rat's nest and then topsy-turviness. I've, I've heard the word topsy-turvy, but I didn't know you could have topsy-turviness. But all of these things talk about chaos. And what John says in his book is that all of this chaos leaves us with hurry sickness. And he describes hurry sickness as um, us always striving, hurry, 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 but never arriving. And maybe that's how you feel today. Um, in my house, if you lived with me, you would either love me or you would hate me because I love organization. I love to organize things with purpose. And when I complete a, a project that's been organized and it makes things function better, it just makes my heart happy. Anybody? Anybody? Okay, two people. All right. Well, I grew up, uh, you know, as an adult into adulthood with a child. We were married for four months, and then I got pregnant, had Micah five days after our first year anniversary. And so my greatest failure when it comes to organization is laundry. Can I get an amen? Right? So I have 
five boys. Two of them are out of the house and doing their own Davis laundry. I have one who's getting ready to leave, but he's going to college, so you know he's going to bring it home. And then I have an eighth grader, which they don't care about their laundry, right? And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to be a good mom. And I, over the years, have come up with a million different systems on how to do laundry. And said, there is the gray basket. Oh, struggling here. Okay. Here's the gray basket. Children, tell them what the gray basket is for. Please, out of the three, somebody say what it's for. Dirty laundry, that's right. The gray basket is for dirty laundry. And then I'm like, you know what? I want to help them out, so I'm going to create them, give them their own baskets. And it says their names, and it says this is clean only, right? Like here's the, and then I'm like, this is a great system. But the problem is, is that, like, it never happens. And so I'll, like, look in here, and somebody's done laundry, and they throw it in here. Then there's the basket. You all have this basket. You know what I'm talking about. What is in this basket, people? Oh, my gosh. Yes, socks. Socks with no friends, right? They never have a partner. And they're, I don't know where they come from. I went back in my office, and there were two socks on the ground. I'm like, I thought I picked those up, right? Socks everywhere. But the whole point was I want to make what feels difficult easy. I want to bring organization, right? And the problem is out of all of these years of marriage and raising five, four boys and being married to a, a boy man, none of them None of them share my desire for organizing laundry. And so when I began to think of this, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is it. This right here is the best analogy for life. Right? I don't know why, but I am shocked, anybody with me, when there's a lot of laundry. How, where did it come from? Why do we have it? But we wear clothes every day. We're going to have laundry. And I think this is how we look at life. We look at these words that are often enemies with one another, right? These words that constantly are, are floating around in our hearts and mind that we feel like we have to pin them against each other, where chaos is always the enemy of order, overworked versus balanced, complicated versus simple, easy versus hard. And so then we read books like this, and then we're like, okay, i got to find that simple life. I got to find the simple life, and I got to find the easy life, and I got to find the ordered life. And then we are completely shocked when we find ourselves again in another situation that feels chaotic, that feels messy. And so I'm wondering if what if we kind of reframed the question? What if we began simplifying our lives and eliminating our hurry and our worry and our overpacked schedules and our overspending and all the things that we know we do when we're running from one place to another? What if we began to reframe asking the question how to simplify our lives by first acknowledging that we live in a chaotic world? Right? We live in an earth, on a planet, that has order and peace in some areas and has chaos in others. We live in a humanity where some of us are in really good, restful places. And then there's some of us that, like, talk to someone who just has an infant. Like, we have so many babies that are born. I'm like, please come to church so I can hold them. Like, so many babies. Like, talk to them. Like, talk about chaos. And then there's, there's, there's chaos that you never saw coming. We have a family, the Keels. They, um, she had their son a couple weeks ago. And baby Grayson was born with some complications. And so he's going to have his second surgery, just weeks old. And they're tired. And life feels complicated and chaotic. And so there's this depleting factor that, man, this is how life is supposed to be. But what if we began to reframe by acknowledging that life is complicated? I want to read this passage found in Psalm 19, and it's re written by King David. And to know King David is to know he's made a lot of mistakes. He's a murderer. He's an adulterer. He was really not a real good father. But somehow in Scripture it says that he was a man after God's own heart. And so then he says, he prays this prayer to God. In Psalm 19 he said, The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. 
Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message is gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun and it bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. It rejoices like a great athlete eager to run the race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and follows its course to the other end. Nothing can hide from its heat. The instructions of the Lord are perfect. If you have your Bibles open or you have your Bible app, Underline that, highlight it. The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving to the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. David is saying, listen, God, I know that you are good and you are trustworthy and you are constant and you are pure and you are clear. Like in the midst of the chaos. But then David takes a hard turn. And even in the acknowledgement of who God is, he begins to say in verse 11, They are a warning to your servant, a great reward for those who obey, obey them. And then he says this in verse 12, how can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? How do I know? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. Then he says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. And then he makes this declarative statement, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I mean, we literally could spend the rest of our time going verse by verse, but the purpose for that verse today is that this is our foundation that we are using to build from on finding a life of simplicity. And what David teaches us is that there are two major things happening here. One, that he is saying God is there. He is constant. He is pure. He is clear. He's not hiding from you. He's not trying to, you know, make the way hard to find him. He is here. He is there. And then he declares, but I'm messy. And life is hard. And I I know that I have these sins lurking in my heart And I know that I'm choosing sin, like I'm being deliberate, like I'm doing things I know I shouldn't do. You see, to begin simplifying our lives, we acknowledge the simplicity that God is present. God is present. And to simplify our lives, we have to recognize that we live in a chaotic world. And we see this throughout the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's the the Gospels are the first four books in the New Testament, and each one of them is the narrative of Jesus' life. And when you look at Jesus' life, it's very interesting. Like literally from conception, chaos, right? Sweet Mary is is, is pledged to be married to Joseph. They're going to have a great life, right? It's going to be amazing. And now she's pregnant, and she's a virgin. And I don't know about you, but I'm sure her friends had some things to say, right? Like chaos, And then Jesus is ready to be born, and there's no proper place for him to be born. So then he's born in a a stall, I don't know, like in a barn, chaos. Then he's born, and then they realize that the king is out to kill him, so then they have to leave and go to a foreign country as refugees to escape his wrath, chaos. Then they move back, and and they they live in this obscure town of Nazareth, And then we learn that when Jesus goes with his family back to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, he decides as a 12-year-old, he's going to start teaching at the synagogue. The problem is, is he didn't tell his parents. So they leave, and for two days, they don't know he's gone. Chaos, right? Ooh, and a major grounding. right? And this is before Jesus has even started his ministry. See, Jesus lived smack dab in the middle of complicated, complicated issues, complicated relationships, and yet, hear me on this, he was never in a hurry. 
Jesus was never in a hurry to strive to live the life he was called to live. And yet, he was never in a hurry. And also, we never see him fall into that lurking sin, never letting chaos control him. And so the question is, how? How did Jesus live this simplistic life in a chaotic world? How did he do it? And he's so clear. The first is Jesus was committed to solitude and prayer. I literally probably could take a whole, our whole time reading passage after passage where Jesus left. And if you still have your notes out, I want you to, you don't have to write down the scripture, but I want you to write down the scripture reference. The first one is Luke 5, verse 16. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. Luke 5, chapter 5, verse 16. But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. Mark 1, 35. Before daybreak the next morning... Jesus got up and went to an isolated place to pray, Mark 6, verse 12. Jesus went up on the mountaintop mountaintop to pray, and he prayed to God all night, all night, Mark Mark 6, verse 31. Then Jesus said, speaking to his disciples, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. See, alone time and solitude for Jesus is a place where he went to to prepare for the chaos that he would ensue. Prayer and solitude is where Jesus went to make hard decisions, to ask God for his will to be done through his life. But what we see in this pattern of prayer and solitude, we also see this pattern that the choice to retreat To find that solitude was never easy. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 13, Jesus is told that his beloved friend, John the Baptist, has been brutally murdered. He has been beheaded in in just the cruelest way. And Jesus' first response in verse 13 is, as soon as Jesus heard the news, he got in a boat to retreat. And so what oftentimes happens is you read these scriptures kind of as one liner, but I want you to go back sometime this week and read what has happened or is about to happen as Jesus has tried to get away because this moment where Jesus gets in the boat to try and go and have solitude and, and find refuge with his heavenly father it is met with chaos because people fa- follow him and not just people, like crowds of people follow him. And the the scripture goes on to say that he began to teach them. And he taught so long that that it was time to feed them. And the disciples being awesome friends. I love when I read the Bible because I was wondering like, oh, I wonder who I would be in this. I definitely would have probably been the disciples. They're like, send them home. Right? It's been a long day. We know your heart is hurting. Send them home. And Jesus says, well, what do we have? What kind of food do we have? And the disciples are like, dude, we have like two fish and a couple loaves of bread. And, And Jesus is like, that'll do. So he feeds the thousands. Thousands of people. So this moment where Jesus was looking for prayer and solitude was met by a day full of so much, so many people with needs, so much teaching, and then a miracle. But after that passage, there's this this powerful conversation where Jesus finds the time to go away. He finds the time to be in solitude. See, getting time alone was never easy for Jesus. I want you to think about that. The simple act of prayer also often became a difficult task. But Jesus knew the importance of spending time with the Father. It was where he poured into. It was where he was given a holy assurance, a confidence to walk boldly in who God has called him to be. Because here's the truth that I want you to hear. In his humanity, Jesus always had the choice to choose sin. Think about that. In his humanity, he always had the choice to sin. 
Have you ever accomplished something, like maybe ran a marathon or got that promotion? You did something that just, it took a lot of effort and you made it happen and then someone was like, good job, and you receive their affirmation, but you know deep down that they will never, ever know the work that you put in to, to make that accomplishment happen? I think this is often true in the life of Jesus that we take for granted his humanity. And if there was a gold medal to be had for prayer, Jesus would have won it every single year of his life. You see, he was as much human as he was God. And I often wonder which part was the hardest to struggle through. A sinful human heart and the fragility of a human heart or obeying God the Father and the authority he had of heaven. Regardless, Jesus knew that prayer was the lifeline to live without sin. And what is true for Jesus is true for you. So many of us are going from here to here, and we're striving, and we're striving, and we're striving, and we're never arriving. And Jesus is saying, hey, come to me, all who are weary, It's that passage of scripture Justin talked about last week in Matthew chapter 11, verse 30. Listen, he's saying, my yoke, like the life I've placed on you, is easy. The burden I've placed on you, it is light. But remember, we live in a chaotic world. Life is going to get hard. It doesn't mean living a simple life means life gets simple. But simple life begins when we recognize, when we are anchored in to who we are in God, that he is trustworthy, he is good, he is pure, he is true, he is clear. See, solitude and prayer provide these holy rhythms to live an unhurried life in a chaotic world. See, Jesus lived a simplistic life through prayer and solitude, but he also lived a simplistic life through community. Simply put, Jesus built community. Now, I know that seems like a very oversimplified statement, but I chose that word built intentionally. When you look at the life of Jesus and his friendships, he had a close group of friends, but he didn't like sit around at the pub and was like, I hope I meet somebody, right? Like he actually went out and he went, he went out to his disciples who were like fishermen and didn't know him from Adam. I think it would have been totally weird, but they're like, he's like brought his, you know, his elementary. Do you want to be friends? Yes or no, right? Like he, he says to him, hey, drop your nets and follow me. Let's be fishers of men. And they're like, okay, cool. Right? He had these group of people that he was intentional with. He didn't just have friends. He did life with friends. But let me be really clear. Being friends, being a friend of Jesus, being associated with him, talk about chaos. Right? You never knew like when crowds were going to show up. And when Jesus would say, hey, take your loaves and your fish and feed them all. You didn't know when Jesus was going to flip some tables in a synagogue or turn water into wine at a wedding. You never knew, was he going to yell at a guy to come on down from the tree? Like, to be associated with Jesus was kind of crazy. But to be friends with Jesus was simple. Why? Because he was present. He was available. And we see this throughout his life and throughout the Gospels. In fact, in Mark chapter 1, there's this moment where it says that Jesus is leaving with a a, a group of his friends that are also the disciples, James and John. And they decide to go over to a set of brothers' house that are also disciples in his close uh, circle. Simon, also called Peter. I don't know why it gets so confusing. I'm just going to call him Simon. but Simon Peter, same person. And his brother Andrew. They go to his house. So Jesus and James and John, they show up. And then Simon says, Jesus, my mother-in-law is sick. And so there's this tender passage in verse 31 of chapter 1. It says that Jesus went to her bedside, took her by the hand, and helped her sit up. And then the fever left. And she was healed. And so she gets up and she ends up making this dinner And I just picture this small group kind of laughing and rejoicing of this shared experience of healing that they had together. But then there's like a knock at the door. And so I don't know about you, but it's like after dinner, the night's done. Maybe I'm just old. I don't know. But people come to the door because they know Jesus is there. And they want healing. And then people that are uh, demon-possessed show up. And that had to be really intense and really chaotic. But Jesus continues to love 
He continues to show up and he continues to heal. The Bible said that he did it until like the sun already went down. But then we read this passage that we had read earlier in that same chapter. It says before daybreak the next morning. So Jesus had gone to church. He had gone to his friend's house. He healed the mother-in-law. He ate supper and then he healed I don't know how many people, but he still made it a priority to get up the next morning, to go to an isolated place to pray. Why? Prayer was the first friendship. Jesus knew that solitude and prayer provided him time to be with his best friend. And I don't know about you, but oftentimes I forget about the friend I have in Jesus. And so I try to be in the mess with others. And I try and fix it. And I try to be somebody I was never meant to be. But Jesus knew who he was because he knew who he was in God. Within his close circle, Jesus was transparent. He was honest. He would tell them when he was hungry. He would tell them when he was tired. He took time to listen and explain things of heaven. And they often had no idea what he was talking about. Right? They got on each other's nerves. There's this part in scripture where they're like literally talking about who's going to be the best in heaven and get to sit next to Jesus. I'm like, they're killing him off and he's at the dinner table. Like, talk about strange conversations. But they were normal people. But Jesus, here's the part I want you to hear. Jesus knew who he was. He was not waiting for his community to define who God called him to be. Right, he knew his mission. He knew what God had called him to. And what is true for Jesus is true for you, that he has a calling on your life, that he is not looking for you to lean into your community to to get the affirmation to be that person. What he's saying, I want you to lean into community because that is where we learn from each other. Jesus valued what he learned from the disciples. He was friends with them when he knew he would be betrayed. He was friends with them even though he knew they would never have the vast understanding of the knowledge he had. He was friends with them when they were annoying. He was friends with them when they didn't want to do what he knew he he needed to do. And he's the savior. He provided miracles. And maybe for you, that's the friendships that's missing in your life. The, The community you're doing life with feels chaotic and you feel like you're never enough for that person. Never show up enough. Never say the right, not right stuff. And then there's another person in your life that just sucks the life out of you. And because you're a Christian, because you love Jesus, you just let them trample all over you. Right? Jesus is saying, I've created you perfectly to be who you were meant to be. And when you trust me, then you get to be a part of community and be a part of the ebb and flows when one of us is in the mess and the chaos of it and when we're in the the simplicity of life going good. Jesus chose to be our friend. And if that friendship is missing in your life, to have a relationship with Jesus is just to acknowledge that Jesus is who he is, that he came as a helpless baby. And he, like I said, went through all of this drama and trauma, but he still chose you. That when he died on the cross, he took on your sin. But the story doesn't end on the cross. Three days later, he, he is resurrected. And in his resurrection life, the game of how we live life, the simplicity of how we get to live life is completely changed. Because now we have, to, we have a relationship with him. Through the power of prayer, we get to commune with each other, show up for each other, pray for each other through the power of Jesus. And he just says, believe in me, walk with me. This is why connection groups are so important here at Hope City. Because community allows us to learn from and lean into God. And I want you to think about your relationships Right? Again, who are those people in your life that showed up when others were walking out? Who are the people that you saw a little bit more of who God is, a little bit more of of what Jesus has done through that relationship? See, community allows us to learn from and lean into God, but it also allows us to learn and lean in 
to each other. Lastly, Jesus lived a simplistic life in this chaotic world, not just by choosing prayer and solitude and not just by being a part of messy community, but because he trusted God. Jesus trusted God. There's this passage of scripture that if you've been in church, you may have heard it before, but I hope that you listen to it or read it with a fresh lens when you think about your relationships. And it begins in John chapter 11, verse 5, and it says, Jesus loved Martha and her sister, Mary, and Lazarus. It just starts out out of the gate that we know that Martha and Mary and Lazarus are like his people. Right? They, they, they broke bread together. They did life. They were in his inner circle. So we know that, they, that he loves him. But then oddly, I love how that says that. Oddly, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Think about that. If your best friend was sick, I don't know about you, but I am hurrying over to them. I'm going to clear my schedule and make sure that I am there to come be with them. But Jesus... He oddly, when he hears the news that Lazarus is sick, he stays for two more days. And then, after the two days, he says to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. This part gets me every time. They said to him, Rabbi, means teacher. Like they're acknowledging he knows, they believe he's the Savior. You can't do that. I don't know about you, but there's so many times where like I just tell God, I boss him around. Like, oh, I'm going to do that. Have you been there? These are the disciples walking with Jesus. They just fed, he just fed thousands of people with two little fish and little loaves of bread. And then they dare to say to him, you can't do that. And what does Jesus do? He simply replies. Reminds me of that passage of scripture in Psalm 19. He replies in verse 9 and 10. Are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in daylight doesn't stumble because there's plenty of light from the sun. Walking at night, he might very well stumble because he can't see where he's going. In other words, Jesus is saying, guys, I appreciate that you think I should not go back to be with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha because you think that the Jews are going to kill me, like his people. But I'm trusting the timing. I'm trusting that God knows the timing. And so in verse 32, it says, When Mary arrived and saw that Jesus had finally come to be with them, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here. If only you were a better friend. If only you would have showed up. Like I've seen you show up for so many other people. If only you had been here. If only my brother wouldn't have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up in him. He was deeply troubled. See, Jesus had to deal with everybody's feels, everybody's take on what he should do or shouldn't do. But Jesus knew what he was doing, and he didn't have to hurry to strive to be who everyone thought he should be. In fact, it goes on to say, in verse 34, they told him, Lord, come and see. And then this very simple three-word phrase, then Jesus wept. And he wept because he was sad. He wept because these were his friends that were aching. And then in typical human fashion, the people, verse 36, who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him, right? They're like, oh, he is crying on their behalf. And then there's those people. But some said, well, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Right? There's always one. But we often put Jesus in this space as if he's never dealt with the chaos of our relationships. And Jesus is saying, I've been there. I've been there. Verse 38 Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told him. And this is where it gets really intense. 
because Martha comes to him and says, Lord, my brother has been dead for four days. You've missed it. And you were not there. And you didn't provide the healing. And if you remove that stone now, it is going to smell so bad. Like, I can't take any more on. And Jesus didn't respond by lashing out. He didn't respond of disappointment. He didn't respond by saying, peace out, which is probably what I would have done. He said, didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside, and then Jesus looked up to heaven, and he said, Father, thank you for hearing me. And he says, you always hear me. But I'm saying this so that they will believe that you sent me. You see, Jesus trusted God. He trusted God when his friends were for him, and he trusted God when they were against him. He trusted God would hear him. See, when we trust God, we live with a kingdom perspective instead of an earthly perspective. It changes our ability to have compassion. It changes our ability to be able to put on the yoke that is light and easy. When we trust God, we live with a kingdom perspective. To begin to simplify our lives, we have to choose to embrace the chaos. We have to choose the hard work to find the time, whether at night or through the night or in the morning, to spend time with your best friend. And when you do that, it allows you to not have to hurry and strive, but to live a full life thriving in the simplicity of who God called you to be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there are some of us here today, probably all of us in some way, shape, or form, that it's just like the hustle is so real. It's like we listen to these words and even this message and even this scripture, and we're like, gosh, that sounds good, good for Jesus, but like we're really struggling. We're really struggling on how to answer those questions of what we give our time and attention to. We're struggling that our heart is so broken with the chaos of life that just making time for anything feels impossible. For some of us, life is finally good. We finally have the job. We're finally in a place where we don't feel like we're on you know, the struggle bus every day. And so we live almost with this um, unforeseen hurry because we're so scared that this safety of this season will leave. And so we live for our circumstances rather than living for you. And so, God, we invite you into our schedules. We invite you into our relationships. And when you, we ask you that you will give us an awareness that you are trustworthy and you are pure and you are clear and you are true, that you will provide the way. We love you so much, and we're so thankful that we get to do life together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.